You, you ready to talk, gentlemen? I think we're ready to go. Yep, we're ready. Hey. Okay. <clears throat> Avast me hearties and welcome once again to Full Stream Ahead. I'm your host, Charlie, the Professor Esther. And with me as always is my skinny rich friend. It's Maz. And tonight we have a special guest. Some random guy. Say some hello, some random, random guy. 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 <laughs> Can you unmute some random guy? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, technical difficulties. Some random guy. Would you like to announce how you'd like to be known as we talk to you, or do you just want to remain some random guy the um, entire time? SMG. Some random guy. SMG. Okay. Perfect <laughs> for the Southgate Media Network. Right. Um wouldn't it be SRG? Oh, yeah. I don't know how to spell. <laughs> okay. We will keep the identity of some random guy secret. Right, right. It's just, uh, it's just an effort to throw you off. Yes, I will simply say that he is a good friend of mine. Okay, let's get to tonight's episode. Hey, first off, to all of our viewers out there, yes, viewers, because this is the first video-enabled full stream ahead uh we are discussing season two episode one of the mandalorian <sighs> Ooh. the oh it doesn't have a title oh there it is chapter nine the marshal the man the mandalorian is drawn to the outer rim in search of others of his kind our director of course is jean favreau uh, Jean Favreau and Jean Favreau, Favreau uh, wrote this and get the created by credit, uh, along with uh, George Lucas, who gets our based on characters by, or oh, sorry, based on Star Wars by, because these are not characters of his. This is just Star Wars in general that George Lucas created, uh, who is the real hardest working man in show business, I guess, or actually maybe the least. Working the least hard. He doesn't really make that much Star Wars anymore. No, he mostly lets other people do the heavy lifting, but that's okay. That's why you work so hard when you're younger, right? Exactly. You work hard as a young man, you make THX 1188, get Star Wars, and then just start stacking those knots. Um, and speaking of stacking knots, this is a this so, um, I like how this episode starts because we start off in a um, strange uh, little, you know, basically a gambling planet. Well, we don't know if it's a gambling planet, but basically it's definitely a, the bad side of town, of the town, in the country, on the planet that he's at. Because um, he's come there for information and the possibility that someone can lead him to another Mandalorian. Um the guy who's there says, ah, yes, but we want to steal the child. And, you know, and to make this person extra evil, he shoots one of the wrestlers that they're watching. Thanks. They're at what seems to be a friendly axe battle, you know, <laughs> a friendly axe fight, as you have, you know. Yes, money's being laid down, but I don't even know if this was even supposed to be a battle to the death, you know. Me and the boys it's just having axe, axe, axe battle. Yes. You know, but um, what do you think was his motive in in doing that? Was he trying to make a point to Mando about how rough and tumble he was and how little he cared that he was willing to shoot one of his prize fighters? Don't mess with me, kind of thing, or was he just upset that maybe he lost the bet or or he was about to and couldn't afford to? So he's like, "Hey, house never loses." Or what do you think his intention was in well, doing? I believe. I mean, I think his intention in shooting the guy was literally to say you're on my turf i can shoot a guy in the middle of fifth avenue i'm not gonna lose any votes gotcha that's, that's what he was um, trying to say there Matthew, i think i think he i think the noise was just annoying him while he was trying to speak so he just shot him so he can continue speaking but which again goes to that high level of of power you know that he feels he is he is untouchable in this moment. Unfortunately, he's going up against uh, uh, the Mandalorian. And Baby Yoda, our little yiddle, 
um, who immediately, and this is like my favorite scene. This is my favorite scene in the whole series. Is like, as soon as Baby Yoda realizes something's about to go down, you just see him close the lid. <laughs> yeah, I know where this goes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been here before. Yeah, wake me when it's over, Mando. And, <laughs> and it is, again, just this thing. It's like, you know, and this is the thing about, this is the thing about the Pescar armor is it is literally laser proof mm. so you're not accomplishing anything shooting the guy you know i will give that one of them did have it like momentarily pointed at his neck but he knows enough to keep his neck protected right. so that as soon as he does that he's, you know he immediately moves because he knows that's the threat and it takes out that that guy and you know then just beats everybody up you know i thought the guy who was pointing the gun at his neck was the guy who shot the wrestler no no that was a different guy um that was one of the henchmen uh the the guy who shot the wrestler was the one was the cyclops that he was talking to um, i know that what was their game plan? How did they expect to beat a dude wearing Beskar armor? Not only wearing Beskar armor, but was born to be, not born, but I guess bred to be wearing that armor. Well, yeah. um, uh, no, well, how did they think they well, were going to win? Because it looks well, like they had no idea beyond shooting him with an ineffective weapon. Well, I mean, they, since Beskar was very rare, some Mandalorians did not really have that material to use as armor so maybe they thought he was just wearing some other type of armor maybe but, that, but then why would they try to steal something that wasn't Vescar? they had to know it was Vescar. yeah i'm guessing yes. that yeah i mean I, my guess would be that you know i guess the basic idea is you know and it's sort of like the whole stormtrooper thing you know, um, people will make jokes about how ineffective stormtroopers are until you actually get good stormtroopers together. And this is actually something I was talking to Tristan about, that one of the biggest problems that the Empire has is that because the Empire has to be spread over so much area, they can't send their best people to every mission. So that basically you see a lot of, and especially when you think about like the Death Star, the guys assigned to the Death Star are not going to be the, the top tier people because you're this far behind enemy lines they're basic these are basically like finn he's basically a a sewage uh, you know a sewage worker you know these were the guys that basically came into work every day punched in punched out cushy union job they were not frontline soldiers you know and even when they are frontline soldiers you know you're gonna you have to spread out and if you have like one elite guy he's gonna rise in the ranks and then you're gonna put him with his own division but he's always going to have just this group of cannon fodder who's just there for the paycheck. May I say something? Yes. Um, well, uh, stormtroopers are, even though some of them might not be better than others, most stormtroopers I have heard went through uh, intense amount of training just to become one. But uh, I guess that doesn't mean that all of them are really that good at what they do. Yeah, well, that's the problem, because if you have to manufacture that many stormtroopers, you have to get that many stormtroopers into the position, you're going to essentially exhaust. There's going to be some who, you know, there's going to be some C students, basically, in this. And I'm sure the recruitment centers are incentivized with such a structure that they're just putting anybody through. Exactly. Oh, oh that guy passed the training. Trust me, he's going to be fine. Not pay me. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think what we're getting here is people that are just underestimating him. Because they, you know, if nothing else, they're thinking, okay, maybe we can't get the armor off of him, but, or maybe we, the, the, you know, we can, because he's going to have to block all of our shots. Maybe if we can have him block all of our shots, there's good, one shot's going to get through. You know, but of course, immediately he knows that. And he's, it's sort of like Andre the Giant says in The Princess Bride, you know, it's very different when you're fighting six guys or one guy. And when you fight six guys, there's different ways that there's different moves that you're going to use. And I know those moves too. He says, that I don't usually get to fight just one on one. But of course, Mando, he fights one on one and he fights six guys at once all the time. So he's very good, no matter what the situation is. Um, but anyway, in this moment, he, uh, he does um, 
defeat the 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 rabble that were trying to because actually they wanted the child i believe if, if i recall correctly because they knew that there's a bounty on the child you know and i don't even think it was even the best car armor that they wanted you know they just wanted the child because that's the bounty you know well maybe they thought hey there's not only a bounty but there's also this super rare material it's a win-win if we kill this guy we get two things well exactly that like, is true too like every quest in dungeons and dragons you're like hey bring me back this thing whatever else you find that's yours to keep exactly and um so anyway but and i love you know because he does defeat the guy strings him up by the lap post because of course the guy runs because he is not the fighter he can he can kill people when everyone's else behind him but he's he's the brains of the outfit he's not really the guy who has gotten his this ain't the kingpin he hasn't gotten his hands bloody working his way up the kill ladder so when he gets hung from the lamp post by his feet because as the Mandalorian says, I promise you, you will not die by my hands. It's a very um, Batman moment. Yes. Um, yeah. Although, yeah. You know, and it, and the difference is that the Mandalorian kills. And the Mandalorian has no problem with you dying. You know, Batman would probably feel bad if you actually did die from no, something he did. No, he would feel really clever and really proud of himself. See, I didn't do it. I didn't break my code. And he'd be yes. feeling really good about himself. <laughs> yes. But, you know, he gives him the, the statement that there's a Mandalorian on Tatooine. So that's all I know. That's what it is. And he's I've been to Tatooine. There's no Mandalorian over there. So, no, it's in this thing, this mining town, a Moss Paisley or something. Pelgo? Moss Eisley. No, Moss Eisley is where he lands. Oh. Moss Pelgo is where he goes. Darn it, Juan, I keep on accidentally turning off my phone. There's a lot of mosses, except this is one that had gotten wiped out, but also is a rebuilding little settler town. And um, he goes there. We get, um, we, oh, uh, Amy Sedaris back uh, as her as her character. I'm blanking on her name right now. Check the IMDb real quick. Uh Amy Sedaris. Yeah. Uh, Peli Mato, um, who is the Mechanic. who is the mechanic um she's awesome and uh she basically uh you know tells him you know i don't you know i don't know of any other mandalorians here i don't know what you're talking about but i do know where moss uh pelgo is and basically shows him a map and says there's nothing on this map he's like i know that's where it used to be that's where it's supposed to be um uh you know he he uh he takes he takes the child with him because he does not want, because he knows if he ever leaves the child with other people. Although he sometimes breaks this rule if he feels it's safe enough. Um, but and obviously. He's forced to. He's not forced to right now, so he's coming. Yeah, so he's coming with him. And um, yeah, because actually I think later he does leave. Maybe he, no, he doesn't because he'd have to go back. Yeah. So it's, it's very complex. But anyway, um, he takes the child with him. Child hides, and we basically get the big scene with the marshal. Um, and he sees the marshal in the doorway, thinks he's a Mandalorian, and then he comes and takes off his helmet. Yeah, and um, uh, yeah, you probably already know this, but ooh, the armor he's wearing it's Boba Fett's armor. Whoa! Yes, <laughs> that was the big fanboy moment. It's Boba Fett's armor, and he is, um, he is uh he is he is mad that this guy has this armor because he takes off his helmet and says that means you're not a mandalorian although that's going to become an issue in later episodes as well but we won't get to that no spoilers yet spoiler alert that's why i said we'll get to that in next episodes but we're not going to explain it because it's not a spoiler if we just say that's going to be an issue later um anyway so yeah uh the guy basically says look you know when the empire fell uh, all these, you know, this mining consortium just came in and shot up the place and killed everybody. And I ran and I got saved by Jawas, which is one of these another moments because there's like a couple moments in there where, like, you know, the Jaw, you know, the people like Jawas, and, and you get this real understanding of the racist overtones of the Star Wars uniform universe, the human supremacy 
of the Star Wars universe, where it's like, you know, actually the Sand People have lived here for thousands of years. You're on their land, you know. Actually, we don't know if they're not human. They could, they could be wearing a mask, and yeah. they could be just humans. Well, they could be. Well, they're clearly humanoid. Maybe that should be enough. And the Jawas are always seen, and much the way the Romani are seen. They're traveling people. They're scavengers. And very yeah. much like if you've ever read Dune, they're like the Fremen people of the desert there. They wear these steel suits that keep them uh, viable in the heat with, uh, with the, the dust and everything. And same with the Javas. They live in the desert. They're nomadic people. They move from sitch yeah. to sitch. And um, they live in the desert. And they have a way to live uh, in the desert. And it involves a very specific kind of suit. Um, and they're viewed as not as advanced as the people running the planet of Arrakis. So it's, it's kind of uh, the yeah. same thing as the Fremen people in Dune. Wait. Um, I just wanted to give you... Just a fun fact about the Jawas and Mandalorian. In season one, uh, apparently those are like a different race of Jawas than the ones on Tatooine. Like so, there's so there's like off-world Jawas. Like yes, oh. yes, and the difference is some have red eyes and some have yellow. Correct, Tristan? Yeah, and they also have like lighter uh, clothes. Yes, so there are different groups. As it turns out, you can be in the same group yet have different rituals and customs. Hmm, I wonder if that'll come up later. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, but and I'm trying to remember why it was that he, oh, that's right, because he stole something from the, uh, from the people that were blowing up the place, and it turned out that he basically just ran off with a bunch of very valuable crystals. And again, this is where it comes into the Jawas, they're not bad people. Because they could just say, hey, we saved you from the desert. Give us what you have. But it's like, no, we'll trade you. You know, we're going to nurse you back to health, and we're going to trade you what, you what you are owed. And this is, I mean, this is a classic Western trope. The idea of the person, you know, who may have negative views of the savages, but, you know, gets captured by the savages and find out, oh, my gosh, you're actually really kind and norm normal people. And you just want to deal with the world in the way that you deal with it. And in their culture, you don't take from people. You trade. They're like the Ferengi. Ferengi don't steal. Ferengi cheat. You know, it's a different, it's a different legal thing. We, we had a contract. We fulfilled our contract. If you signed a bad contract, that's not our fault. That's how the Ferengi look at it. And so they'll sell you a defective, you know, R5 our, our droid, which, you know, wound up uh, at Aunt Amy Sedaris's house eventually, but you know. Um, also, uh, uh, that R5 droid, it was not defective. R2 was just a big jerk and actually like made the, and like actually attacked R5 units, so yeah. it would kind of blow up. Kinda. Let's face it, everyone associated with the Jedi are awful people. Um, <laughs> that's what we can say, and R2 is no different. R2 is just He's like the Punisher of the droid set. He just goes around just smacking people around, taking what he wants as he needs to, which isn't really the Punisher, but, you know, he's sort of the Punisher, too, because Punisher has no problem stealing drug money to pay for whatever he has to do. Just always see him walk out with a big bag of cash, you know? Hey, you know all the drug dealers took all the money. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, you know, bullets aren't cheap. <laughs> But yeah, so the so the guy uh, trades it for the Beskar armor, or not the Beskar, or the we don't know if it's Beskar or Durasteel. Officially canon, it's Durasteel, but we actually kind of maybe get the suggestion that it's actually Beskar in this, or at least a Beskar Durasteel alloy, and maybe that's what makes Durasteel is it's a Beskar alloy. Um, Isn't Boba Fett's armor made of Durasteel? And I think yeah. that's, and I think that's. Also, um, what like other Mandalorians use, like in Clone Wars, there were like these mall Mandalorians in Death Watch, and they were shooting each other, and they were both dying, and they were using like uh, they weren't using Beskar because Beskar was rare. Yeah, Beskar is very rare, and so but like like titanium, you can mix it with other metals, and it gives you some advantages. So like if you do a titanium aluminum, ti ti titanium and aluminum and iron you create um t you create stainless steel which has certain advantages over simple titanium steel you know but you give up some of the durability of titanium steel and even titanium steel itself is its own 
making a steel alloy of ti titanium, I actually believe is stronger than titanium, or at least it's more, more workable than raw titanium. Yes. Uh, I just want to say something. Most likely uh, throughout this video, I'm just going to be the guy that tells you about the Lauren story. So just to give you guys. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that some random guy. Um, and you're happy. We, we welcome you whenever you need to. All right, moving right along. Um, uh, basically, you know, they have their little stare, stare down. Uh, little hides in the spittoon, which... Uh, you know, my son did not know that that was a spittoon. I had to explain to him what a spittoon was. He was like, ew! But anyway. Um, <laughs> he was apparently uh, hiding in a barrel of spit. Yeah, that oh. is what a spittoon is. <laughs> yes, at least we hope that that's what they use a spittoon for. Because there's you know, other things they could be using that spittoon for in that bar. Because, you know, we still have not seen a toilet in the Mandalorian universe. But anyway. Um, well, maybe it's just decoration. Maybe he... Yes, like... maybe it was simply a potted plant. But yeah, but that's that's the idea. And then we also get that again when we have, when we see, um, when we see that in the transit to the place, um, uh, you know, um, Mando really, you know, communicating with the sand people. And he actually speaks sand person. No, you you have to call them Tuscan Raiders because that's I think at least offensive name to call them than. Well, actually, I think they're technically Tuscans. Call them Tuscans. Yeah, because the Raider is to imply that they are you know attacking people, which is what the townspeople see them as. You know, the people who just come and steal their stuff, which is normal in yeah. that situation. It's two people want the same land. People who got the the no basically what this is this is something that happens throughout history is settling people will come into a place that nomadic people have been visiting for years, but with all of a sudden they get there and there's like a town there, and they're like, oh well, okay, we just want to go to that water hole that we go to for that we've gone to for five generations, and the old no, that's our water now. It's like you can't own water. It's like. Okay, what? Oh, you you have to unmute, random guy. Time for some random guys' fun facts. Did you know that Tuscan Raiders' guns actually are not blasters, but they actually shoot projectiles? Um, I did not know that, and that actually makes sense. Um, and of course, as was as we learned that the Mandalorians, when they fought the Jedi, actually started using projectile weapons. Be because they were things that the Jedi could not easily deflect. Yeah, they could because they could deflect a blaster bolt, but like if you did a shotgun, they were kind of like you would they would get peppered by it. So it's like it was it was I an interesting. I think it might also be because since since bullets are smaller than blaster bolts, it's kind of hard to pinpoint where to block it. So yes. so if you have like a minigun, just go. Uh, guns blazing if you want to kill Jack. Yes, and of course, and the thing is, is you can say, well, couldn't they just use the force to block it? Actually, the problem with things like that is you can only move, that you have to move the object, and there's no difference in using the force to move a small object or a large object, but if you have a thousand large objects coming at you at once, it's really hard to grab them all and control them. So, you know, this is, but this is all the things. This is what we get in this thing where we talk about the war between the Jedi and the Mand Mandalores, but that's not this episode yet. Um, right now, what we're Stop spoiling. It's not spoiling to say it's not in this episode, some random guy. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what they all say. <laughs> anyway, let's actually continue with the story. Yes, so they do go because they do know they're going to, because basically there's, we, we get the attack of the uh, crate, the crate dragon. Um, which is this large beat. He's going to tell you, this is the weird thing. For a desert world, Tatooine has a lot of apex predators. Um, and speaking <laughs> of that apex predator, um, uh, another fun fact is that um, in the original, like um, 
when they first made the Star Wars before you know they remade it and added CGI. Uh, the the scream that um the scream that uh Ben's no not the, the Obi Wan Kenobi <laughs> oh, makes Kenobi is Kenobi is the uh, is the Great Dragon War and then they decide to reuse that uh yell for the Great Dragon. <laughs> Yes, so that's when Obi Wan Kenobi scares away the sand people in that one scene. He's making a crate dragon roar, but um. Hmm. So anyway, but in this in this moment, they basically agree that if uh, Mando helps the marshal get rid of the crate dragon, he will give him the armor, which leads to them realizing they're going to have to work with the sand people. Uh, or the Tuscans, or the Tuscan Raiders, you know. Um, they probably have their own name for their own people. Like, maybe Jawas don't call themselves Jawas, you know. It's like, actually, we're these you, we, yeah, you know, but, you know, that's what people call us, so. And also, or supposedly speaking... now. Oh, yes. They speak you sign language. Continue. Well, exactly. That's the thing, is that actually the noises they make are, more, it's sort of like the opposite of what, you know, people on the East Coast do. Well, we use our hands to emphasize what they say they did and they go mur, 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 mur. i think they I it's think, just giving some emotional context to the syntax of their hands. exactly yeah and then yeah. it's and it's cool and it's neat and it's and again goes into this thing where we're giving levels to these cultures that we don't usually get and that is, and again, like I said, this is a trope of Westerns, but it also also something that was sorely lacking in the Star Wars universe. Um, uh, moving right along. So they agreed to this, you know, and basically what they come down to is they're all going to get together. They're all going to kill the crate Dragon. When they kill the crate Dragon, they you know, those, the, 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 the Tuscans will have a truce with the town. They will not. They will not start any fights going forward. Which is one of those classic things where it's like, well, we won't shoot first if you don't shoot first. Then as soon as one of the other guys just decides he has to shoot first because he's just can't stand sand people being in the neighborhood, you know, that's racist. when it all goes to heck. But um, that, that's racist. Yes, it is. As <laughs> actually, is Star Wars. Actually, speaking of uh, one day, everyone was upset about them teaming up with the Tuscan Raiders. I think one of them actually said, we don't need their kind. Yes, they did, because that's what they say. But they do agree that they're going to do it, and they're going to work together, and they... Yeah, let, let's point something out, that that's, you know, everybody learns, and everybody has a starting point. You can't hold that against them. You, you got to expect them to get better, and you got to expect them to learn, and you can't banish them uh, into a realm of you know, oh, they're bad people and they can't be redeemed or anything like that. That helps no one. Well, and, exactly. and the whole purpose of this episode is that no matter where somebody starts from, they have the room to grow into better people and you've got to give them that room if you ever want them to get there. Well, exactly. And to be fair, and as, as I've said, this is a classic conundrum between settling people and nomadic people. You know, that nomadic, you know, that limited resources... And that's, and that's usually what it is, is, that there's a place that limited resources exist, and settling people want to settle where there are limited resources. Nomadic people move from resource to resource, so they don't exhaust the resource. And now but, you're coming and throwing off their whole system by taking one patch of land and exhausting the hell out of it. Now yeah. they can't flow in their system of, of managing their resources any longer. You're yes. depleting one area. But along those same lines, then the settler says, no, we can manage this resource. And arguably they can. It, it, it happens when people settle. They often are saying, okay, we, this is the place that has water. We know how to use the water. We can maintain it. But it, when someone else is coming in, that's when that becomes problematic for the, for the settler. So everyone has a perspective, you know, and, you know, no one is ever fully evil. No one is ever fully um wrong in these situations you know unless they actually have more than they need and what we see here is we see two groups of subsistence living people who are fighting rather than working together and what the point of this episode is is that when we are at that subsistence level when there is no difference between what you're trying to do and what we're trying to do 
we can actually work together and maybe accomplish something great. And they do that when they get the, you know, and they all work together to kill this great crate dragon that has been damaging them. And of course, it's the sand people that have all the knowledge. They say, look, we know we, we've been studying crate dragons, you know, life cycle for, for centuries. We know when they eat, we know how to keep it asleep. We know what to do to get it to a certain point. And we know that when you do want to kill it, the only way you can is to attack it from underneath. And they set it up where they get the bombs set up. And it's really cool how it does play out because it does come well, into this. Well, yes. Um, they, don't, they didn't really know. Uh, at the, when they try and lure out the crate dragon, the crate dragon decides, I'm tired of uh, space cow. Let me eat this Tuscan Raider. And so they, they didn't expect that to happen. They thought it would eat the cow. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, there's certain things that happen in that, but, um, well, he eats, I think he ate the cow and the Tuscan Raider, uh, cause... And now they, he don't, like, um, uh, they he left the cow alone. This... Oh, he did? Okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a little while since, I've been a couple of days since I did my rewatch. But anyway, so, in this moment, though, they, you know, they do, they do, and here's the thing, I think that it's possible that it could have crawled back into its hole and would have died after they do the initial blow up, although we do see that the crate dragon, like, spews acid, um, which, again, I do wonder if maybe the sand people's clothing gives them some protection of it. You hear them screaming, but we don't necessarily know that they died, you know? I think they did die, because... Because they seem to be pretty disintegrated. I think when they actually got the acid thrown on them, they actually kind of disappeared. Uh, I mean, that's possible, too. I'm not quite sure. Because I, I didn't see that. Maybe you were watching closer than I was, some random guy. Okay. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, and then it comes down to this. And it gets to this really beautiful thing where, um, you know, Mando realizes, okay, I know how we can get him because he sees that, oh, that cow has all the bombs strapped to them. And if I can get it to eat that, then we can detonate the bombs from inside. And that is essentially what he does because he, and he, 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 he wagers that the best guy is going to keep him safe. And if he, once he's inside, he can it it is a gamble, though, and, and he does not hesitate, not for a moment. Duty calls, and the code must be obeyed. Mm -hmm. You got to love that. Wait, but, um, yeah. Um, it, even though it shouldn't have burned uh, the, the Vescar, shouldn't the rest of him be, be burned, you know, the parts that weren't in Vescar? Well, you know, but that comes to that maybe the, what else is there, because as we say, we know... And this is one of the things that was discussed. Um, we know that it is living in a, a an empty. Um, what, what, uh, what was what was the creature called? Um, a sarlacc. A sarlacc pet. It was a, it was an abandoned sarlacc pet. And they said there's no such thing as abandoned sarlacc. Pet. Unless you eat it. Unless you eat it. So basically, yummy, yummy. in my tummy. Yeah, so basically the crate dragons eat the sarlacc. So sarlaccs eat all the smaller creatures on Tatooine. And then the the crate dragons eat the sarlaccs. Um, but that is also why, arguably, um, Boba Fett was possibly able to survive the digestive processes of the sarlacc. Because remember, the digestive processes of the sarlacc are that it digests you over over like a hundred years, which means that it's a very slow acting dissolving agent, but it can't get to you if you're covered in your Durosteel or Beskar armor. And he's wagering that whatever the crate dragon is spewing, it's not enough to damage his Beskar armor. Um, so he tells, I believe he tells the marshal, whatever happens, take care of the kid, you know. And then he does a Han Solo moment and whacks him into his backpack and then he flies away. Yes. Same spot. It's a flaw in that design. Although it has been pointed out that if you actually look closely, you'll see that that backpack actually has damage in that spot. And that's essentially what happened is that it, that, that backpack was damaged originally and that damage is what caused it to causes that one to 
go off like that. So anyway, he defeats it. Uh, they blow up the crate dragon. We see that the Jawas, the reason, oh, not the Jawas, the, why the Tuscans wanted the, because the, they just want the i from the, from, from the dragon, you know, that's all, that's all they want, that they get to keep the i and they realize that there's a gigantic pearl inside, and it's one of these things where this is actually apparently a highly valued commodity. Shouldn't there be multiple pearls with how much it's been living in the sand? I don't know. It could be. Maybe there's more than one pearl in there, but they we see them have one. And okay. so one imagines that they then trade that and that sort of and it goes into that that whole nomadic life. They have they get that thing that they know has value and then they can trade that and that's what sustains them as they travel in their world. You think How's they you think they ate all that crate dragon meat? I mean that had yes. to have fed the town for like a year, right? Yes, yeah. speaking of, how good do you think crate dragon tastes? I, I, I bet it's pretty delicious. Oh yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. And then we actually get um Is that this episode where he goes back to um or is that next episode? No, this yeah. episode. This, yeah, I trust I think that was next episode. That's right. They kill the crate dragon and they go their separate ways and Mando heads off into the sunset with the Beskar arm with with the Durstil armor. But and then and then ooh, something ooh, oh. weird happens. We see I wanna I wanna say we see a man watching him that looks like someone we know. It looks like Django Fett, and since Django Fett is dead, it only means one thing. It's Boba Fett. Ah! Yeah. It was- now, so here's 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 what I thought. I don't think that uh, the marshal got the armor the way he says he got the armor. If this other Mandalorian is hiding out and he does not want to be found, wouldn't it be a great move on his part to give the marshal his armor and say, hey, there's this other dude over here snooping around. I don't want him to know I'm here. So pretend like you got this armor. It'll throw him off the scent and he will leave. Mm, well, the only problem with that is I think I don't think he I think that the armor is necessary for the marshal to take over. So he obviously has had the armor for a while. So I think every I think his story is true. How the Jawas got the armor, that's where it gets complex. They could have robbed him. Well, no, because we don't I doubt that. Jawas don't well, rob. That is true. They will steal a droid, but droids aren't people. So But they have feelings. Droid lives matter. No, yes, but, but aren't, aren't, aren't droids property? Exactly. Droids are property. So they can't well, no, they're not they necessarily. No, droids actually aren't necessarily property. Only if they have a master that they can denote. If you have a droid that's walking free and they don't have someone that they can be given to, they se- suddenly become salvage. It's like if you found an old car by the side of the road. In their culture, that's, that's salvage. So that means you can just take it. You can just take it, yeah. Now, it's possible that the droid could object, and the droid, if you're if you're a protocol droid like C-3PO, you could say, no, I belong to, um, who did he belong to? It wasn't Wedge Antilles. Um, I forget who he belonged to. Um, he belonged to Luke Skywalker. No, then- before then. Before then. Yeah. He, was, he belonged no, to... No, because he mentions his master before... His master... Oh, wait. Yeah. His master was Anakin. He built... Oh, yeah. Well, yes, but that was before, and he actually had his memory wiped of that. Anyway, so, yeah, so it's possible a droid could actually dispute their ownership, which is probably a whole range... There's probably a whole range of droid law in in the books in the Star Wars universe that no one has ever explored. But I guarantee you, there was... There was lines of ownership that would say what became a salvageable droid. Because clearly droids can be salvaged. Droids can be reprogrammed, you know, and that, that is seen as a different kind of thing. So I think, in the, but in this situation, my, my assumption is that either when he got out of the Sarlacc pit, if that is Boba Fett, which we assume it is, but though as someone else has pointed out, it could be actually just another clone trooper that doesn't have the rapid aging uh, flaw. Well, maybe it could be just an old clone trooper that decided to shave. Well, yeah. Like Captain Rex. It could be Captain Rex, uh, Wolf, or who knows? It could be Echo. Yeah, but a lot of... Well, Echo... 
Yeah, I mean, it could be Echo, actually. And Echo, because of his cybernetic components, might not have aged as rapidly. So it's a possibility. But either way, this guy um, could be Boba Fett. And given that we have Boba Fett's armor, it's implied that he may be. And the idea could be that when he got out, he shed his armor. You know, or he traded his armor to the Jawas for something else. But it was also suggested, because you see that he actually has a sand person rifle, um, that he was actually one of the one of the people living with the sand people at that time. One of the people li living with the Tuscans. So there's a lot of, lot of possibilities at play here. So that's the question that we're left with. Okay, so let us wrap up this episode, I guess. Um, some random guy. Um, we don't have any social media, really. So uh, Yes, I do, maybe. You, you can okay. find him at some random place. Yes. Do you want to <laughs> give it? To, do you want to give your YouTube address for people to look at your um, game, your playthroughs? Uh, well, I haven't been posting on it a while. Okay. Uh, but you can still sub subscribe to Toxin Gamer 13, but I haven't really posted, so you don't have to. Okay. Okay. And Moz, if someone would like to get in touch with you. Oh, they can email me at mozmanzor at gmail.com. That's M O W Z M A N Z O O R. And I almost forgot all of you guys. Uh, we're recording this uh, just after Thanksgiving tonight. Um, I want you all, if you listen to this before Christmas, go down into our show notes, find the um, Capes and Lunatics uh, or Capes and Lunatics. Uh, sidekicks gift guide to find gifts that we recommend for all your friends and family um and while you're doing that uh you may find tweaked audio headsets on there you may not but if not go to tweakedaudio.com anyway and get your family and friends wonderful tweaked audio headsets where you can use the, the coupon code southgate to get a discount on your purchase. Likewise, you can use that same exact disc, that same exact coupon code at Hunt a Killer. Get your get you or your loved ones the game Hunt a Killer. It's like a escape room delivered to your house every week. So that's kind of cool. Um, or every month or whatever the period is. But anyway, you gotta help Michelle Gray solve this cold case. It's a lot of fun. You really gotta try it. Use the coupon code Southgate at checkout. Likewise, um, any of the things you see on our, uh, on, our, on our gift list, if you go down to our show notes, you can click to Amazon. You can probably find those things at Amazon to buy. Uh, cost you nothing, helps with the show. And also, while you're there, check out Pod Life, the book, the book written by uh, the Southgate Media Group team about why we podcast. It's a bunch of short stories, so they're quick, easy reads. You can get it in paper or digital. And uh, we'd love it if you read it. And then, if any of you would like to write to me about what you found, you can do so in that old-fashioned email way the way our Moz and Paz once did at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And, of course, follow me on the Twitter as I live tweet Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, the new DuckTales series, Come Explore the Disney XD Disney After Universe reboot. It is amazing. I think you'll love it. Please do so. At Charlie Esser, that's C H A R L I E E S S E R. Look for the two E's in the middle. For quality. Bing. Thank for you, quality. Guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for boarding our ship once again and sailing off these crazy internet seas. Join us next week for another episode of Full Stream Ahead. Arg. See you next week. <laughs> okay. Love it. Love it. Yes. Okay. So let's. Can end I have, uh, five minutes? Yeah. Yeah. We'll take we'll take a quick five minute break, end this, save this, and um. Yeah, okay, stop the recording. Want to record a, a a different recording or yeah, no, yeah, the, yeah. No, no, the, can, can we can we keep it the same or no, no? They want us to have a okay, separate so then, recording. Then what I'll do is I I will stop this, save this, and then uh, send you a link for a separate one because the recording will be it saves it that way. So I want to save yeah, it. Yeah, no. Uh, and, and do you guys okay. need to cut this out because it's still being recorded? Yeah, no, no. They yeah, can, yeah. They'll they'll cut it out. That's yeah. that's Phil's problem. <laughs>
It was probably right, not so, ours. All right. All right. So let me uh, hold on one second. I'm going to stop.